Uh, welcome to my channel, uh, Learn Maxillofacial Surgery. Today, we are going to uh, show you a video on orthognathic surgery, a mandibular setback osteotomy, bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. This is a young patient who has a prognathic mandible with a class 3 relationship. She has got a reverse overjet of about 6 millimeters, and we have planned for a mandibular setback of about 8 millimeters pre-op uh, x-ray and she had undergone pre-operative uh, orthodontic treatment of leveling of the arches and uh, uh, correction of the crowding and also uh, the decompensation which has already been taken care of. Um, the uh, wisdom teeth many a times needs to be removed usually about six months before the surgical procedure however in some circumstances it can be done during the surgical procedure. A lateral cephalogram um, helps in analyzing the profile and in this case uh, the SNB was significantly more and that's where we had planned for a mandibular bilateral sagittal split osteotomy. Giving local anesthesia uh, into the operative area helps in reducing the bleeding when you're raising the flap. Um, nasotracheal intubation is mandatory and the tube can be secured by using a stitch right in front of the nasal septum so that uh, you don't have any tapes and the whole face can be exposed. The incision is done in the retromolar area. Uh, you can say it's a kind of a modification or a larger incision uh, which we use again routinely for the wisdom teeth. The distal incision is um, uh, taken more buccally. Uh, that's very very important. Um, you go from the wisdom tooth area uh, that's just behind the 7. Uh, if the 8 is uh, already removed or if it is buried inside then from the distal aspect of 7 you take it to the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. And then you progress along the clavicular incision and then give a vertical relieving incision usually up to the second premolar area. Um, a subperiosteal dissection is carried out so that the entire flap can be raised. And then as we go distally, you can use a forked ramus retractor on the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. This fork helps in retaining uh, the position there on the anterior border of the ramus and retracts the tissues beautifully, giving a very nice exposure to the ramus of the mandible. Uh, once the buccal area has been exposed, then we go on to the lingual side. Absolutely important that you're in a subperiosteal plane so that the entire ramus anterior aspect of the ramus of the mandible is identified. It's absolutely important that you identify the lingula and you place your periosteal elevator just above the lingula so that you are able to basically visualize where the inferior alveolar nerve enters into the uh, mandibular foramen and enters into the uh, mandible. Now the lingual cut um, Hugo Obvigiza basically described uh, the sagittal split osteotomy and then Hunsuk modified it and the key is to understand that the lingual cut is essentially made up to the lingula. Then the vertical cut is made. I like to use a post stamp method and then joining these uh, vertical cuts and then you have to do the buckle cut. And to do the buckle cut, it's a very good idea to use a Oti retractor or a channel retractor and you can basically make a straight vertical cut going from the lower border of the mandible to the second molar region. Uh, very important, you go through the cortical bone and again you can see the way in which we are doing the post state stamp method. A fine drill is basically used, an 8 or 10 number drill you can use and that basically uh, should be taken to the full length of the working bit of the drill usually about seven millimeters so you're basically going through the cortical bone and thereby you are able to get into the cancellous bone the moment the drill reaches the cancellous bone you will invariably get a bit of uh, bleeding and that indicates that you're at the right depth now it is very very important that you make these cuts uh, to flow together that means that the buckle cut and the vertical cut has a smooth curvature and similarly the vertical cut and the lingual cut has again a smooth blend and thereby you don't have any stress forces which are accumulated. 
Once the cut has been completed, then you can use a fine osteotome. Uh, different width of osteotomes you can use, different sizes of osteotomes. But the key is to use it very, very gently so that you basically spring the bone um, rather than splitting it. So the nerve is the crux in the whole surgery. The whole length of the inferior alveolar nerve has to be in the distal fragment. That's the fragment which has the teeth and not in the proximal fragment which has the condyle. So that's the key and that's why you need to do it very, very gently. If you see, gentle taps is all which I've seen a lot of uh, surgeons banging and that basically causes a splat. A gentle tap is what you need to gradually do it. And then once you get the springing effect, then you can use a um, smith spreader. This is again a very useful tool to just spread very, very gently. Again, you can see with finger pressure alone, you can basically use to split the bone. So the split really, really happens in such a way that you don't suddenly snap the bone apart, but you need to do it gradually. And at this point of time, it is very important that you basically identify the course of the inferior alveolar nerve. The neurovascular bundle is the key. And a lot of times it is in the proximal fragment. So this is very, very important. That means that it is in the fragment which has the condyle. Now, the key is the neurovascular bundle has to be in the distal fragment. That is the one which, and that's where you can see the neurovascular bundle there. Very nicely using a fine Harvard's periosteal elevator or a Moltz type of periosteal elevator, you can tease it out and make sure that it is on to the distal fragment, not on the proximal fragment. Once you've done uh, the nerve, basically is in the right fragment, then you can basically complete the split. You can use an osteotome uh, to further separate the bone and it usually completely becomes free. Once you have done that, then you can use finger pressure and then basically do a blunt dissection so that the pterygomacetric sling is also basically completely uh, freed up. Once one side is complete, then you can move on to the other side. Again, as I said earlier, giving local anesthesia helps in reducing the amount of bleeding when you make your incision. And that's where you're seeing the distal cut. So feel the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible and take your distal cut right onto the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. And then you make your um, mesial cut. That's the forward cut which you are doing. So try to get a triangular point so that it's easier for you to approximate the tissues. And again, make a definitive cut to the bone. If you have some adhesions there, especially if you've taken the wisdom tooth in the last six months, there could be a bit of adhesions and a combination of sharp using knife dissection and then a blunt dissection using a periosteal elevator. A fine periosteal elevator helps in raising a mucoperiosteal flap. And that's what you're seeing with the Austin's retractor. You can see the way in which the buccal flap is completely stripped from the retromolar area. That's the superiostal plane which you need to go. And once you're in that plane, then there is really very minimal amount of bleeding. And that's one nice thing. Then you use the fine periostal elevator and go towards the lingual periosteum. And again, try to be in a subperiostal plane. So what happens is when you're in that subperiostal uh, plane, there's a nice envelope and there is very, very good access and visibility of the ramus of the mandible on the lingual aspect. And that's where this can be a bit tricky when you're raising the lingual flap uh, using a bit of fine dissection helps. And that's the uh, forked ramus retractor, which is now engaging the anterior border of the ramus. You can see the way in which the fork abuts into the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible. And with a sweeping motion, you push the um, retractor um, superiorly and thereby it engages the, you know, all the way up to the coronoid process. So you get excellent visualization using a forked ramus retractor. Then the lingual tissues are very, very gently retracted. You can see the key again is to go in that subperiosteal plane. Once you are in that subperiosteal plane, then you can take a Harvard's periosteal elevator and go all the way towards the lingula. So this is the key, um, dissecting the soft tissue and making sure that even in the wisdom tooth area, 
your basically in a subperiosteal plane is the key occasionally you might get some fat there um, fat comes in the buccal side as well as on the lingual side in the pterygomandibular space and that can be very easily dissected out and that's what we are doing over here identifying the lingula is very very important because the lingual cut has to be just above the lingula so thereby you're basically protecting the inferior alveolar nerve so very very gently retract the tissues here the temporalis basically gets attached to the anterior border of the ramus of the mandible using cautery or basically a knife you can basically dissect the temporalis out so that you can get very good visualization onto the lingual aspect of the ramus of the mandible that's a bit of fat which you can see sometimes you her it herniates in the pterygomandibular space that can be very easily removed um, with cautery you can just take it out or basically gently you can tease it out with the scissors so it doesn't come in the way when you're basically making your cuts the key is basically your lingual retractor usually the Harvard's periosteal levator which is abetted many a times you use two of them so that you get good access onto the lingual aspect once you identify the lingula then you make the lingual cuts and that is what I'm doing you can see the lingual cut just taking through the cortical bone so this is the lingual cortical bone now um, again one of the tricks which I follow is as we go laterally don't just go horizontally but start going slightly inferiorly so there is a beautiful curvature so that you're curving and joining the lingual cut to the vertical cut see the way in which I'm now slightly inclining that makes it much more easier and it prevents a splat so a traumatic basically split which many times can happen can be prevented by giving that gentle uh, roundness in the curve joining between the lingual cut and the vertical cut so to make the vertical cut now on the ramus of the mandible you make again the post stage stamp method you can see the way in which we dip in about five to six millimeters and the moment you get bleeding as you can see from that uh, each cut which you have made or hole which you have done that indicates that you've gone into the right plane join all of them together using the same straight fissure burr um, that completes the vertical cut so very gently you don't have to really rush in at this point of time take your time absolutely important that you have a good thickness of bone even on the buccal side when you make your split so don't make it very very thick it has to be ideal it usually is only about 2 to 2.5 millimeters in thickness the buccal bone so it is important that you go between the buccal and the lingual plate so that's where you are making your cuts there that's completion of the vertical cut right so the lingual cut goes all the way to the lingula and the buccal uh, cut uh, goes just where the bulge of the second molar is going to the lower border of the mandible so that's where we are basically retracting the soft tissues using a channel retractor or an arteries retractor Oti. Oti is a very very nice retractor it engages the lower border of the mandible and it prevents basically the facial artery being damaged so this is very very important and that's what you're seeing there using a straight fissure burr starting from the lower border of the mandible come superiorly in a straight line and then give a smooth round off as you come to the top and engaging the vertical cut so the lingual cut has a smooth cut to join to the vertical cut and the vertical cut has a smooth curvature joining the buccal cut so doing this you're able to basically split the ramus of the mandible in a sagittal plane and that's how the coin sagittal split osteotomy has been coined uh, that's where you're seeing uh, the cuts being made the lingual cut there the vertical cut and the buccal cut which has been completed Once the cuts have been done and it's also important that you make sure that the lower border has been completely cut then the split is very easy. This is where you're using an osteotome now. Um, again be very gentle in the tapping and go all the length 
um, of the cuts which you have done with the osteotomy. Just gently run it along the entire length. A vertical cut. That's good. That's the springing which you can see which happens there. Very, very small amount of pressure which you need to do. And now we are engaging the buckle cut. Once that's been done, then you can basically use the Smith spreader. And when you do that, you can see the nerve here. The nerve is in the proximal fragment. So it is very, very important that you very carefully dissect the nerve and free it. Um, sometimes you can have still the bone covering the nerve in the canal that can be very easily pulled out using a fine periosteal levator and that's the nerve completely intact which you can tease it out completely and make sure that it is in the distal fragment and that's what you're doing so once you free the nerve completely then you can go further down and complete the split so you can see the way in which our smith spreader is basically spreading the sagittal split uh, in the ramus of the mandible identifying the nerve so a good suction is very very important at this point of time you can use a bit of irrigation also so that you can actually identify the nerve see the way in which the smith spreader is spreading the sagittal split and you can see the nerve basically right in between so once you've freed the nerve onto the distal fragment that's the tooth bearing uh, component of the mandible you are basically using your finger as blunt dissection and completing the entire cut. So you are freeing the entire mandible so that the entire body of the mandible, the horseshoe of the mandible can now easily be either brought forward or in this case it is taken back. You can rotate it, you can alter whatever position you want to and that's where it is such a versatile operation. A sagittal split osteotomy is extremely versatile in terms of repositioning the mandible. Now you can check the occlusion, how much you would like to take it back. Uh, again, if you have a pre-operative splint, that can be extremely useful for you to guide the movement, uh, how much of setback you would like to do. And that's the guide, uh, the splint, which we have done. If it's a single jaw uh, surgery, then there is only one splint. If you're doing a bi-jaw surgery, then you will have to have two splints. So with this splint in position, get the occlusion right and then fix the teeth into intermaxillary fixation. So it's very, very important that you get the occlusion right with the splint in position. It snaps into position. Sometimes the tongue comes in the way and that's where you need to use a Howard's periosteal elevator to push the tongue back and you're able to basically uh, get the teeth into intermaxillary fixation. This is a key thing because ultimately everything depends on the kind of occlusion which you would like to get and uh, a splint can be very very helpful uh, in terms of getting the right position. So using fine uh, wires you are putting the teeth into intermaxillary fixation. You can use the orthodontic cleats itself so you need to tell your orthodontist to put multiple cleats almost on every teeth so that that will help not only in intermaxillary fixation during surgery but in the post-operative phase also you will be requiring elastics to guide the occlusion right so it is very very important that you basically use uh, these cleats the excess bone once you set back the mandible there is going to be always a bit of excess bone in the ramus of the mandible that needs to be removed so very carefully without damaging the nerve it is important that you take it out. So you usually take out five or six, whatever the you know planned procedure. In this case, we have taken out six millimeters of bone on one side and the other side, we have taken out another uh, seven millimeters. So there is a differential uh, moment which we have, plan we have uh, incorporated into this. And once the bone has been cut, then you need to smoothen it so that it nicely adapts into the uh, uh, second component so that you know whatever rough edges are there you need to take it out so that you can get good approximation of the bone on which you can basically use a four fold plate titanium 2 mm plate to fix choice of fixation is either to use position screws 
generally we don't use lag screws here but the position screws are also useful but my personal choice is to use a four hole single plate on either side right and that's what we are doing so the other side also you make your cuts in take off that excess bone simple um, burr is good enough to make the cuts otherwise you can use a reciprocating saw also that's your personal choice and that's where we are taking out about six millimeters of bone and once the excess bone is removed try the approximation onto the you know the distal fragment this is the proximal fragment the bone is being removed from the fra proximal fragment again it's a good idea to hold a um, uh, bone holding forceps or basically an artery forceps to hold the proximal fragment and the edge is basically neatly cut off right so whatever excess bone which is there when you set back the mandible that needs to be removed okay. once that is removed then you smoothen the lingual aspect the medial aspect of the bone so the approximation is going to be much much better and then you use a titanium plate you can see a four hole titanium plate uh, which is being used to fix the osteotomy fragments a two into six or two into eight millimeter um, uh, screw is generally used a two mm you have to have good enough amount of rigidity uh, some people use even a reconstruction plate but i personally like to use a simple 2mm mini plate which is rigid enough and it gives good approximation of the fragment so you can see the way in which uh, the mandible uh, osteotomy is now fixed very nicely adapted both the osteotomy cuts are very beautifully positioned and two screws on either side of the osteotomy uh, should be good enough to basically fix the bone the front screw is being placed and the 2 into 8 mm screws is what which is being used to fix the plate question sometimes is whether we need to use a locking plate it's your personal choice. I use a simple conventional mini plate that has worked in my hands very well. Locking plate probably gives a slightly better stability and a less chance of the screw getting loose. So that is something which you can definitely consider when you're fixing uh, the mandible. One plate is good enough. You don't need two plates here uh, on either side. So it's basically one plate on either side. And that basically gives good enough amount of rigidity uh, to hold the fragments rock solid in position. Once the plates have been fixed, then the intermaxillary fixation is removed and you check for the occlusion. And this is the moment which we are waiting for to see if the condyle is in the right position in the glenoid fossa. Sometimes you can basically dislocate the condyle anteriorly and that is the reason why whenever you're positioning and fixing the mandible after, after a sagittal split osteotomy, you need to ensure that the condyle is as far back as possible in the glenoid fossa. Never bring it forward, otherwise you end up with major issues. So getting the condyle in the right position, checking the occlusion, checking the lateral excursion, making sure that the condyle is in the glenoid fossa uh, is the key so uh, that is something which you need to do and um, it's pretty simple and straightforward to make sure that the condyle is in the right position once you are happy with that then essentially you bring the soft tissues together the bone has already been fixed with the plates now we are basically bringing the soft tissue together and as far as possible try to get a nice watertight closure right um, I personally like to use a, either a 2-0 or a 3-0 Vicryl. I don't like to use silk because silk you'll have to take it out after a week. Vicryl stays back for at least about a week to two. And that's good enough for the soft tissues to nicely heal um, before the resorbable suture material starts falling off. Sometimes Vicryl can stay for up to about three weeks and that's where you would use a vital rapid resorbable suture material which 
usually resorbs in about a week to two. Um, I also like to use a small drain um, so that uh, any blood which accumulates in the pterygomandibular space can be easily sucked out. Uh, you can put it either into a, a, a suction apparatus like a mini suck kind of thing or you can just simply you know use a small uh, catheter kind of thing a number 8 or 10 catheter uh, can be placed in the buccal vestibule so that it just allows any hematoma which is collected over there to ooze out um, just a simple tube um, is good enough for drainage and that's usually taken out after about 24 to 48 hours once the swelling on the right side or left side of the cheek has come down. Three zero vicryl has uh, pretty good on an um, atraumatic needle causes least amount of trauma to the soft tissues. That's the suturing on one side. And then you go on to the opposite side and finish the suturing too. Make sure that um, you irrigate the area nicely with some uh, saline, betadin and hydrogen peroxide so that any bone debris uh, or any, um, you know, fragments which are free or is completely removed and that helps in healing. A simple interrupted stitches or a mattress stitch is good enough which approximates the tissues very well. A simple interrupted stitch which can make a big difference in bringing the tissues together. Take a good 5 mm bite away from the edge so the tissues get bunched up and you are able to get good primary closure. That's the fine uh, drainage tube which we are putting in there and it's gently kept in the uh, vestibule, labial vestibule, buccal and labial vestibule. Um, it's a very small tube, very important that you secure it because many a times the patient is a bit drowsy after the surgical procedure with the sedation which is being used. So it is very very important that all these small tubes are always secured and they don't get dislodged in the patient does not aspirate it. So it's very, very important you take a bite uh, through the tube itself and that suction drainage tube can be removed uh, in about 24 hours following the surgery, 24 or 48 hours depending on the amount of bleeding and hematoma which accumulates over there. Uh, most of the times this is a routine procedure. There shouldn't be any major complications when you do a SAGE. Also good idea to basically apply some hydrocortisone to the lip. The very fact that you've stretched the entire lips and cheek, you are bound to expect a significant amount of edema in the post-op phase. So using hydrocortisone to the lips and to the cheek really helps in uh, trying to minimize the amount of bruising and uh, swelling which is there. Uh, two take-home packs, gauze packs with uh, a ribbon is usually left and I like to use these uh, elastoplasts. These are uh, tight pressure dressings which are sticky and that helps in adapting the soft tissue which has been stripped off from the bone to really adapt back. Usually I leave it for about 48 hours and uh, you know the amount of swelling which you get is very minimal. And that's the post-op phase of the patient. You can see the beautiful contour which has been achieved from a very prognathic mandible we have been able to get without giving any scars on the face and that's the occlusion post orthodontics you can see the way in which we have completed it pre and post both from the front and back you can see the kind of transformation of the patient which you can do when you get these kind of patients 
this is a very very enjoyable surgery very very rewarding in terms of uh, the results which you can get on your patients but it is absolutely important that you're meticulous in the way in which you make your cuts the way in which you make your splits the way in which you position the condyle in and the way in which you fix the bone together and that can really really give you excellent outcomes i hope you enjoyed seeing this video and translating it into your own day-to-day -day practice thank you